as the offering makes its way around to you. I just uh, want to jump back on this online giving and I don't want to make a big deal about it, but if that interests you and you don't know how to set that up, you can stop by our office. We can do that for you from our office and, and set you up. Um, or technology is a little, a little bit of a challenge for you. You say, I'd like to do it, I just don't know how. Stop by the office or give us a call, we'll help you with that. Again, if that doesn't interest you in the least, don't fret it, all right? It's just trying to make it more convenient for, for some to be able to, to give that away. Heroes and zeros, and a few sheroes as well. Now we're in this series. We talked about uh, Gideon. We talked last week about Naaman and Gehazi. It's kind of fun last week. Some people say, you know, I've been going to church a long time. I didn't know about Naaman and Gehazi. So it's kind of fun to, to preach something that they didn't know about. And today, I, I'm guessing you'll be familiar with our story today and our, and our zero turn hero today. These Bible characters that we're studying, they dressed differently than we do. They uh, ate differently, but really they're a lot like us. They had different culture, but much like us in many, many ways. I think God has the same lessons for us at times, and that's why we study. And remember again, Paul wrote Corinthians. These were written for our instruction. So this isn't just pleasurable reading. This is written for our instruction. And so we're visiting these stories um, so that we can learn and gain and that we can see how God works. Today we're going to begin. I'll introduce our hero in a different way. So I've got a little... Uh, <coughs> object lesson for you today. We'll see how this goes. I got a red and a blue. Which one's larger? Don't try to outsmart this. Just, you know, which, one? which one? Blue. Blue. Same. How about this one? Now which one's larger? Right. <laughs> Same size, aren't they? Isn't it weird how our eyes can deceive ourselves? We can be deceived. When I was a kid, I liked magic trips. And I would go downtown Lincoln, Nebraska. I, I can't believe it. We, we'd ride the bus downtown. My brother and I and one of my brother's friends, Brad. And, and for like 30 cents, three dimes, we would ride the bus to downtown Lincoln and hang out all day by ourselves. You know, that, that would never happen these days. But that's what we did back then. We could go to Little King. It was kind of before Subway. And we could have our sandwiches. And, and I can't believe Mom and Dad let us do that. But we just did it. And, and we hung out. And we ran around. But they had a magic shop in downtown Lincoln. And I was sort of enthralled. And I liked the thing you could do. And I liked the set. You know, it was fun to, to see how you could fool people. So I would, I kind of got into it for a little bit. And so I bought some magic tricks. And I decided, I'm going to do a, a, a magic tricks for our neighborhood. And so I invited neighborhood kids and um, charged them 10 cents. I made a dollar 50. We had 15 kids in the basement of our house and I did these magic tricks. And um, after my first trick, someone says, is that it? And uh, anyway, I did my tricks and it really went pretty good. Um, but my mom got afraid that I was gonna get into magic too much and she didn't want the black magic, you know, the weird magic out there. And so I think she kind of Put the kibosh on my magic pursuits. David Copperfield should be thankful. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, I still have used it with little kids and different things. But anyway, we're easily deceived. And we kind of go, wow. And, and um, our hero today was a deceiver, a trickster. Someone who was cunning and smart, but he deceived people. And he worked his way through life and got success by taking advantage of deceiving people. Maybe someone comes to mind. I hope not. I hope you don't come to somebody's mind. But maybe we we'll, we'll get that way and we we'll deceive people. Jacob was a deceiver, a trickster is what he was. In fact, that's what his name meant. That, it meant deceiver, Jacob. We find today he was a man who wrestled with God. I'll give you a quick background, quick history lesson. Most of us are familiar with Abraham. Abraham had a son, Abraham and Sarah. Do you remember at 65 years old, they said, you're going to have a, a son, and you're going to have this great lineage. And they're like, yeah, right. You know, 25 years later, I believe that's right. I'd have to check my st stats on that. I think Sarah was 90, barren. She couldn't have any children. And, and God had promised 25 years earlier 
you're going to have a son. And she laughed, and I mean, they all, it, I mean, just think through that a little bit. He's older than 90. She's 90, barren. No, I'm not going to do it. God does this miracle, and they have Isaac. Okay? Isaac was the one that was going to be put to death at one point on a camping trip. Okay? Abraham and Isaac, remember they looked for the ram, and uh, it's an awesome, awesome story. Isaac has twins. Okay? So Jacob, the one we're talking about today, his grandpa would have been Abraham. All right? So Isaac and Rebekah are expecting twins. Jacob and Esau. Esau was the oldest, and he was dad's favorite. The birthright, which we don't really understand, the inheritance, the blessing, goes to the oldest son. But Esau really didn't care. Esau was one of those guys that lived for a moment. Hey, let's do it. He comes back and he's hungry, and he sells his birthright to Jacob, the younger son. And in a spur-of-the-moment decision, impulsive, he sells his birthright. I don't know exactly how that happens, but the blessing was Jacob's. God had promised it to him anyway. But anyway, Isaac is now old. This is Jacob's dad. And um, he's deceived. Trickster deceives. Mom is really the instigator. Mom says, hey, I want you to get the blessing, not Esau. And Esau was a man of the field. He had the hairy arm, manly, and he would bring in uh, goods from the outdoors and cook up venison and stuff for for dad, and dad like that. Dad sends him out. Why the why Esau goes out? Jacob comes in. And they put fur on his arms, and they bring in some goats that they cooked. And Mama's the one that instigated all this. And so they, the trickster was part of the family. They fool dad. Dad gives the blessing then to Jacob, the younger son, which which never happened, but happened in this case. So there's lots of deception going on. Esau is furious, promises to kill Jacob. Jacob runs for his life. So we got this dysfunction going on. Anybody have a family that you don't get along with your brother or sister and it's been going on? So for years, Jacob is running and he falls in love with Rachel. He gets deceived. He worked seven years and uncle says, no, you're not going to marry her. You're going to marry the oldest one, Leah. And then you had to work another seven years. And I'm thinking, that's awesome. I mean, it's 14 years. He had to wait for Rebecca. My son's getting married in September. I don't think he would work 14 years. He loves this girl very much. But anyway, so he was deceived. He thought after seven years he could marry her uncle deceived him. And so this deception is just rampant. It's just part of the way they live life. Finally, Jacob gets married. And uh, um, a second time, so he has two wives, which I don't understand all that happened with that. But after 20 years of that, he leaves his uncle Laban, and he's humbled a bit through all this process. Sometimes life humbles us a little bit, but he's scared. In chapter 32 of Genesis, Jacob still says, thinks his brother's out revenge out for his life, and that's sort of where we pick up our story. Jacob is one on one with God. Genesis chapter 32. We'll read it here in a moment. I remember. Another story of Brian Lincoln, Nebraska, Pershing Auditorium, third grade birthday party. We went to watch All Star Wrestling. That was before WWF and WWE. All Star Wrestling, maybe you, you remember it, maybe you don't. But it was a birthday party. I went with third graders again. I'm surprised my mom even let me go um, to this crazy event, Pershing Auditorium. We go, and it's Tarzan Tyler and Cowboy Bob Ellis. They were the big attractions then, and uh, obviously it was staged, and, and it looked like, I mean, Cowboy Bob was the the one everybody liked, but Tarzan Tyler, he was the mean guy, he had the long blonde hair, and nobody liked him, and, and over and over it looked like he was going to win, he gets thrown out of the ring, he breaks the trophy, he cuts Cowboy Bob, or catch up probably, but we, you know, a little thing blood, and finally Cowboy Bob wins, and everybody goes crazy, okay, but I, I went home thinking, there's nothing attractive about wrestling. I chose basketball, and tennis, and golf, and other sports, but um, I never wrestled. But I do have a lot of respect for our wrestlers. Uh, wrestling is a difficult, difficult sport, and it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's you 
against them one-on-one. -on -one. Jacob gets to the point where it's one-on-one -on -one with God. A wrestling match. Recorded in the book of Genesis. Probably Moses is the one giving us this play-by-play. -play. And it takes place near a, a river named Jabbok. An open-air arena. It wasn't Cowboy Bob or Tyson Tyler. It was just Big Jake versus God. Or an angel. Or a man of some sort that represented God. So we'll read the story and then we'll dive in. Genesis 32, 24 through 29. The same night he arose and he took his two wives, his two female servants and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. So here's what's going on. He was going to meet up with his brother and he didn't want to take everything he owned and he broke them into two groups. He said, you go first. If they take you, I still have a group left. How would you like to have been like the first group? You know, I'm like, oh, gee, thanks. But he was trying to appease the anger of his brother. If he offers gifts or does this, then he can make amends with his brother or not lose everything. So it wasn't very good thinking. He sent both groups across. One went, the one went. And then he was left alone. It was just him. And God sees an opportunity to go one-on-one -on -one with Jacob. Okay? And Jake, verse 24, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Our story today, God finally gets one-on-one -on -one with Jacob. And Jacob is in a position to see where he is, but it's just him. He lived a long time, a lot of deception. He was clever, he was busy, he was deceitful, competitive, he was successful. And he probably took things that belonged to others. He'd stolen a birthright or a blessing through deceptive means, again with mom's help. He took livestock from his flocks, from his uncle Laban. So now he's on the move, trying to hunt him down. His brother's trying to hunt him down after lots of anger through the years. He's on the run, but now it's time to meet up with Esau again after years and years. I'm reminded you reap what you sow. He had sown a life of deception. It was offered back to him as deception. And so now he's going to try to meet up. He was prosperous. He had wives and kids and flocks and livestock. His stuff. He had all the stuff. Probably slowed him down a little bit. Isn't it amazing how our stuff slows us down a little bit? Lots of stress in his life. And the guys are going, yeah, with two wives, it wouldn't be stress, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so now he's on vacation all by himself, and he has this wrestling match. Anybody, and remember vacations that were supposed to be relaxing but were stressful? Yeah. We had, I had an older brother and two younger sisters and you know, we would jump in the car. We never went on, then we did, we went to North American Christian Convention. It was our, our uh, big trip one year, we went to California. But most of the time we'd go out to Western Nebraska or something. But we would jump up in the in the back window. You guys used to do that? I mean, you know, seat belts weren't even a thought of, you know. One would be laying up in the back window, there'd be three in the, in the seat by themselves, and oh, it was crazy. Couldn't have been stress-free vacation for mom and dad or four of us back then. Uh, again, you reap what you sow. I, I took a lot of kids on youth trips. They did the same thing. I mean, they were all over the place. We had buses and vans, and then came back to mommy. Because mom's prayers being answered. I hope someday you get someone just like you. <laughs> she apologized over and over to Barb. I shouldn't have prayed those prayers to your kids. <laughs> so Jacob sends out spies to get a report. What kind of mood is Esau in? They come back and said, it's not pretty. You're not going to like the mood that your brother's in. It's not good. So he sends out his wives and his kids and his flocks. And uh, one group goes ahead, the other one waits, and uh, 
So he's left alone here. Isolation can be a dangerous thing. It can be a very good thing. And I would encourage you to spend some time alone with God. But one-on-one -on -one is sometimes scary. One-on-one -on -one oftentimes reveals things that isn't revealed when we're not one-on-one. -on -one. In junior high basketball, in practice, we sometimes do one-on-one -on -one drills. One guy at the free throw line on offense, one guy at the free throw line on defense. You get three dribbles, and you've got to see what happens. And what it does is it exposes your weakness as an offensive player. If I have three dribbles, and junior hires are famous for using lots of dribbles, but when you only have three, most of them back up, and all of a sudden, they're not in a place to do anything. And so what we try to teach them is to do something. But it exposes your weakness as a player. If that defender shuts you down, you've got to learn to do something different. And one on one, some of the players really relish it, and some of the players are like, no way. Because one-on-one -on -one exposes things that being in a group doesn't expose. And Jacob's exposed him. One-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes we live such busy lives that we don't go one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes we prefer not to go one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't seem to make sense for us to take time out of our busy schedules and go one-on-one -on -one with God. But if I had to encourage you in any way from personal experience that can be a refreshing time and, and I'm not a guy who likes to sit around but I cherish one on one time God, I, I get to my office early or I go for a walk down the river or the wagon bridge or wherever it is and you go one on one and God can do some amazing things sometimes it's hard but most of the time, it's refreshing. So I'd encourage you as individuals, find some time to be one-on-one -on -one with God. Five, ten, fifteen minutes. So Jacob's alone with God. Jacob is ashamed of his past and afraid of the future. Have you ever been ashamed of your past? Afraid of what's next? Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you're ashamed of something that happened recently. Maybe you're at a point where you just don't know what's next. You, you've got bills coming in, or you've got unknowns, or you've got health issues, and you don't know, and, and you're afraid. And what do we sometimes do when we're ashamed of the past and we're fearful of the future? You lay at wake in bed, and, and you're wrestling with God. You ever done that? Just wrestle with Him, and you can't sleep, and toss Him and turn, and, and you and God are just going back and forth. You don't want to give in, and you do want to give in, and you can't sleep, and you look at the clock, and you go, oh, it's 1.30. And at 2.30, you're going, oh, it's 2.30, and you're wrestling with God because there's this fear of the past and this fear of the future. Sometimes the older we get, the more fearful we get. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. I saw it in grandpa. I see it in my mom and dad. The older we get, fear sometimes sets in. But God did not give us a spirit of fear. It's power. Anyway, they're wrestling. And Jacob is wrestling, I think, with his past and his life of deception. He had worked his way through life just deceiving people. And I think he's coming face to face with that. He's not getting along with his brother. They didn't have perfect families back then. We don't have perfect families now. There's strife. We see, oftentimes at funerals, families struggle from years ago, and all of a sudden they have to share the same room, or they have to get together, and there's bitterness and regret. That's where Jacob was. What do you do? You hang on? Hang it up? Where do you go from here? It's tough wrestling with things that life puts in our path. So Jacob, he's ashamed, he's afraid, he doesn't know what's coming next. He wants to make things right with God, he wants to make things right with his brother. I see Christians living in fear. We fear changing jobs, we fear new things. Teenagers live in fear with what's next. Elderly live in fear. Why? Because we are afraid of the unknown. But oftentimes the unknown is full of blessings. 
in our story today, Jacob finds out God blesses those who surrender. So they have this wrestling match. I'm not sure exactly what that was. Does a man wrestle with God? But they equated it with God wrestling with Jacob. And they have this wrestling match. It goes on all night. The, the, the sun is coming up. And um, finally this man touches Jacob's hip. And it's out of joint. I know we've had those in here. have hip surgeries. And, and uh, I've never had that issue. I didn't hurt a hip playing basketball. Um, that's the extent of my hip. But I know if my hip was out of joint... Wrestling would be done. Okay, it'd be done. That's what's happening. They're done. It says, when the man saw that he's not prevailed against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. This result of wrestling is what brought great change, a changed perspective. Jacob goes from defying God to now fully relying on God. They had this conference and says, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I don't understand exactly what that means. But he wanted God's blessing. After all night long, he was ready to surrender. Maybe you've wrestled with God or wrestled with God. Maybe you finally see things for what they are. I think that's where Jacob was. Maybe we realize, I'm not up to par. I'm not doing this. I, whatever it is, I haven't measured up. Talked about grace, thankful for God's grace. But sometimes when we are one and one with God, we see His holiness and we see our impurity. And we say, finally, God, I've blown it. I'm coming. I'm back. And God gives a blessing to those who surrender. We see it, not just, uh, not just a changed spirit, He gets a new name. No longer is his name Jacob, which, again, meant grabber, deceiver, trickster. Let me read that again. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Here they are wrestling all night long. Hey, by the way, what's your name? At the end of things. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men. And if you're real, that's what Israel means, striving with God. Not a whole lot better than trickster, but much better. And Jacob said, please tell me your name. Why did you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. God finally says, Jacob, who are you? It's time to own up. Who are you, Jesus? I'm Jacob. I'm a trickster. I'm a deceiver. But I want your blessing. You could have fought. This fleshly nature said, oh, I want what I want. But he finds the servant and says, God, I want what you want for me. I'm ready to surrender. And God gives us a new name. He gives us a new name. He gave Jacob, but he gives us a new name. He says, you're my child. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. If you've been wrestling with God, you'll discover like Jacob that victory comes when we surrender. A newness. God can enter the mess of our lives if we surrender, if we admit our sin. That's often when the blessing comes. I pray that as we struggle, we'll desire what our hero today, our zero, deceiver, grabber, trickster, turn hero, wanted God's blessing, wanted to change. I hope we'll discover what he discovered. That God's blessings are worth it. Are you ready to say, God, I will not let you go? I want your blessing in my life. I know what it is. As we wrap up, sometimes you think, how do you, how do you, how do these stories come to life? What do we do with these things? We've talked about Gideon, we've talked about Naaman and Gehazi, today Jacob, and there's more to come. But the one thing that strikes me the most is how we apply this life. The most spiritual thing about those heroes are the choices they make. 
The most spiritual thing about you are your choices. I don't know that that sounds most spiritual. We think prayer is spiritual. We think giving is spiritual. We think coming to church is spiritual. The most spiritual thing about you are the choices you make. If you look at the heroes and the zeros and look at the choices, that was the most spiritual thing about them. So as you think about the choices that are before you, the choices that Jacob made, say, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Sometimes it takes us a long time to get there. But your choices are very spiritual in nature. So remember that as we go through this heroes and zeros. Our choices are a very spiritual thing that God has given us. Let's use the mic. Let's pray. You got to thank you again for the stories, simple stories that we read, but stories that sometimes trick our heart. Sometimes it's a mirror where we see ourselves. But teach us to, to learn from them. Teach us that victory comes when we surrender. Help us let go of the pride. Help us to let go of any deception that might be in our life right now, whether that be in our business, whether that be in our husband-wife relationship or our son or daughter relationship. Let's put the deception away. And sometimes that's painful to get back to the point where there's purity and help us to desire that we want your blessing Father as we leave may our choices honor you we pray these things in Jesus name